I have provided a chronology on page 15 of assassinated sheikhs without killers identified or tried successfully. Right on the speaker. Right on the speaker, page 16 offers this clear chronology of sheikhs and imams that have been killed and at every moment the immediate suspects are Muslims. It is worth noting that in all these cases, the courts have not convicted any single individual. Right on the speaker. Thank you, Right on the speaker. I want your guidance, your guidance Right on the speaker. On this report or rejoinder, when you analyze the attached documents, especially the national IDs, and the vehicles alleged to be kidnapping, you can neither read the number plate nor read the national IDs of the people alleged to be kidnapped. Are we proceeding right to depend on documents that are not to be... I have, I have not read. yet allowed the laying of the documents. We will verify the documents before they are laid. And even whatever is on video, I will first watch in my office before it is laid. So we will we'll look at them. Whatever is not clear, we shall not lay. Yes. I want to thank you, Right Honourable Speaker. My understanding of what the leader of the opposition is putting across in response to what the minister said with regard to identification of the kidnapping or offending vehicles is exactly what the LOP is explaining. That you cannot, because these people disguise themselves. And I thought it would be a matter of interest for government to pick to know how to get those criminals that probably would be tarnishing the government image. Would it not be procedurally right that you guide colleagues first to listen to this and interrogate the issue? As Honorable Fox Odoi said, a matter of human rights should be actually, the NRM side should more, be more interested in this than us. Because tomorrow, you are the ones who will be looked at as Idi Amin. Honorable members. Honorable members, it is to the best of our interest, all of us, whatever we are discussing now, we are representing the people of Uganda, not individuals. When you talk about no for me, no votes for me. It doesn't vote for no. So those are still my voters. Those are your voters. And you can't know there is nothing written anywhere that this is a noble person, this is FDC, this is a NRM or whichever. These are Ugandans and human beings, and we are here to represent the people of Uganda. And when we are here, we should learn to speak one word. When we are in this house, and I, I will tell you, government, we need to promote the rule of law. We need to. Yes. Thank you for your guidance, Mr. Right Speaker. And, and I want to assure the House, for example, that in one of the family visits we made, some of the families of missing people are actually NRM supporters. So we are pursuing this without recourse to color or creed. We are only pursuing justice for these families, Mr. Right Speaker. Former AIGP Andrew Kawes, Felix Kawes. And members, I want you to, to know one thing. Most of these things are inherited. Because I don't think any of you was in the house in 2017. We are inheriting some of these things. But we must discuss them. Me, I was not here. I am also quoting the June 21 attempted assassination of our friend Jeno Katumba Wamala. I'm quoting the September 2018 assassination of ASP Mohamed Chirumira. I am quoting the twin bomb bombings of 2021. Right on the speaker, I wanted the minister to understand why we said that there's a targeting of Muslims to which all of us as leaders, we must really have our eyes open and see whether it is really a matter away from our scrutiny. I don't want to speak on the issue of violations of human rights in fishing communities. 
the UPDF has, out of impunity, continued to terrorize and blunt and torture fishermen in various water bodies, right on the speaker. Right on the speaker, fish is impounded from the fishermen by the military, who in turn make a killing out of it and ultimately enslave the fishing communities. Harassment and death at the hands of armed personnel have been reported on the lakes. Fishermen are terrorized and their nets seized. They are choosed of using particular nets, now deemed illegal, yet they are manufactured in Uganda and others are cleared for import. Right on the speaker, ironically, the government knows about the trading of such gears because taxes are levied on them. Parliament has passed numerous resolutions suspending UPDF activities on water bodies as far as the regulation of fisheries is concerned. All in vain. To date, the Fisheries and Agriculture Act 2022 has not been operationalized and implemented. While the Fisheries and Agriculture Act 2022 deems UPDF presence of the lakes unlawful, they will disrupt fishing activities and profit from the confiscated fish and fishing gear. But on the speaker, on page 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, and part of 23, I am enlisting names of Ugandans that have either been killed maimed or drowned in various fishing communities. And this House of Parliament should not be held complicit in these violations. Right on speaker, I understand that over 80 members of Parliament here are prison fishing communities. They are waiting for a voice on these violations that are provided, including names that can be verified with a proper inquest. Right on speaker. We are on page 23, right on the speaker. Additionally, that these atrocities have spread nationwide on all national water bodies and landing sites. Further mentions can be made concerning cases of report, reported from Chuga County and Lamb landing sites. Right on the speaker. The names I have uh, mentioned there have suffered at the hands of uh, the military. There is overwhelming evidence showing the wanton and reckless conduct of the UPDF on our national waters. Is the Parliament interested, right now, Speaker, in investigating the owners and actions of the soldiers operating boats with the inscription, Watch our semi, let them talk. Whether they are chasing other fishermen, they are very active. Is the Parliament interested in understanding who is behind this? Right now, Speaker, as I conclude, the government is neither willing nor interested in investigating the concerns raised here. Institutionally, the bodies that have attempted to tackle issues of human rights violations have, continued, have continually delved, not delved exhaustively and effectively into the concerns at hand. Dr. Honorable Speaker, the government statement is therefore a replica of past statements on the same. It's not only detached from reality, but it's also laced with insensitivity and laden with mockery for the believed families of the missing victims and the hereby rejected in its entirety. Now, right on the speaker, with a heavy heart and a deep sense of responsibility to address a matter of utmost importance, the protection of human rights within our nation, right on the speaker, we are here to demand for justice and invited the House to join us. Our shared commitment to justice, equality, and the fundamental dignity of every individual compels us to confront the disturbing reports of human rights violations that have come to light. Right now, speaker and colleagues, the reports on abuse of human rights, enforced disappearances and violence are nonpartisan. They cannot be ignored, and they demand a thorough investigation. Where a city government elects to commit or deliberately fail to investigate unspeakable and horrendous actions committed against people, 
by acting extremely intolerant to political dissent and delimiting the civic space as demonstrated herein. The only fortress that remains humbling their hope and trust is the legislature. Let me speak and colleagues. Parliament serves as a stage where the voices of the oppressed are amplified, where people's representatives refuse to be silent about injustice, and where the struggle for human rights is unfettered, fully expressed, and conclusively pursued without fear or favor. Right now, Speaker, precisely that is the billing and the expectation of the public in the legislature is profound. Protection and promotion of the sanctity of human rights is our cardinal role. It is a clarion call to Parliament to uphold this honor. Honorable members, I humbly submit and implore you to rise to the occasion. As a matter of fact, this 11th Parliament will go down the annals of history as having risen to the occasion when the government turned against her people. Let us go on record as a people who knew what was right and acted in the best interest of the citizenry. Right Honourable Speaker, we therefore demand of the following and uh, the support of the House. One, immediate and unconditional release of all political prisoners rotting in numerous jails and illegal detention facilities without trial. Non-trial of these cases is a clear indication of lack of evidence on the side of government and a red flag that these persecutions are intended to shrink the civic space further and criminalize association with the opposition in our country. Mr. Speaker, these that should not be used as a bargaining tool for the ruling party to suffocate civic space and the desire to settle outstanding political questions through these illegal detentions. The Minister of Justice and Constitutional Affairs should explain to the nation under which law the government is charging the citizens with the offense of subversive activities. Mr. Speaker, the Constitution is very clear. You cannot raise an offense that not prescribed by law. I have attacked several charge sheets with the offense of subversive activities, not anywhere on our penal laws. So it's the creation of the government without parliamentary involvement, Regional Speaker. The offense of subversive activities is non-existent, but several people are rotting in jail on account of the offense of subversive activities, which is not prescribed by law, Regional Speaker. Two, establishment of a judicial commission of inquiry. Regional Speaker, we demand that with the utmost urgency, the formation of a commission of inquiry to investigate these glaring human rights violations. We propose that the said commission of inquiry be chaired by a judge of the High Court. We believe that the commission will be endowed with the authority, independence, and resources necessary to uncover the truth, to hold those responsible accountable, and to ensure that justice prevails. Right Honourable Speaker, our prayer is premised on Section 1 of the Commission of Inquiries Act, which empowers the Minister of, the Minister of Justice to issue a commission appointing one or more commissioners and authorizing those commissioners to inquire into a conduct of an officer in public service of Uganda, the conduct of any chief, the conduct of all management of any department of the public service, all of any public or local institution or in any matter in which an inquiry would be for the public welfare, right on the speaker. In specific terms, we move that the commission specifically handles the case of the 18 missing persons, the unresolved cases of targeted slain Muslim clerics, and the infamous November 2020 killings. Right on the speaker, the extent of suffocation of the extent of suffocation visited on our common peoples require an independent hearing, especially in view of government reluctance and a clear disinterest in coming clean and deliberately disabling the wheels of justice several months after these gross violations were reported. We propose 
that the Commission, among others, considers the role of the treaty agencies, political leaders, the general state of intolerance during and after the 2021 general elections, and ultimately, remedy for the victims and their families. Three, need for a select committee of parliament. Right on the speaker, Rule 190 of the Parliamentary Rules of Procedure empowers Parliament to appoint a Secretary Committee to investigate a particular matter. We propose that the said Secretary Committee investigates the rampant cases of rape, defilement, destruction of property, murders, and justified arrests, and illegal closure of many landing sites in the fishing communities across the country, and ultimately remedy for the victims and their families. Four, right on the speaker. All those persons not subjected to military law, not, not subject to military law, and are currently being tried before a military court, be transferred to civil courts under the direction of the Director of Public Prosecution, as directed by the Constitutional Court in Constitutional Petition Number 44 of 2015. Retired Captain Amon Biarugaba and others, Bathurst Attorney General, decided on 15th December 2022 and was never appealed nor stayed. Right on the speaker, I beg to pray and submit for God and my country. Thank you. Thank you so much, Honorable Lord. Honorable members, I have listened to the rejoinder of the law. And I wish to guide as follows. The laying, uh, I, want, I want to look at each document that you're going to lay. Give my people to check. Because you might lay a paper without, when it has nothing. You people, leave me to deal with the law. Honorable members, Lop, you arrange your, your documents, then Mr. Kema will look at it. I have listened to the rejoinder of the law, and the rejoinder was in response to the ministerial statement of um, General Mohosi. The ministerial statement was earlier on a response to the statement from leader of opposition. I therefore don't want to turn this debate into a ping pong. I want to borrow your word. You're the one who used that word, ping pong. <laughs> I don't want it to be a ping pong between the, the, the General Mohosi and then the leader of opposition. We should go straight to the issues that we want to achieve. There are prayers that have been put in place. Let's go straight to the prayers. And I want to reiterate to what Honorable uh, Fox Odoi was saying. We are one house, and whatever we are discussing here is for the good of the people outside there. It is not for a party, not for an individual, and where it requires us to give and take, we will do that. We should be able to do that for the good of the people outside there. I want to now open a minimum, and I'm saying minimum debate. I will have seven people from this side, 10, and five from this side. And then, honorable members, and then we'll have the last response from, from from internal affairs and then the speaker will rule. Have you heard? And no heckling anybody. No heckling anybody. I will only give somebody on this side to speak with the permission of LOP. LOP. Please lay. Let's, let's first have the documents laid by but law. Right on the speaker, the, the, the beauty about the documents I'm laying is that I am quoting each of them. 
in my statement. So there will be yes. no contradiction or problem in appreciating what they are. The video clips at your no, pleasure, no you look problem. at them. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Right, Honorable Speaker, you guided well and, and uh, listened that uh, you'll hear 10 people from the other side and five from this side. And uh, looking at your earlier guidance that this is free seating and that the space reserved for opposition. I know who is opposition. I know who is opposition. And that's why I'm saying I will not give you to speak before you hear from law. I'm guided, madam. Yes. Honorable well, Speaker, I beg to lay the video evidence and the documentary evidence I have outlined in my rejoinder for the attention of the House. I beg to lay. I will review the, the, the evidence and report back if it is worthy. Honorable members, I wish you could all sit. All of you sit. Honorable members, first relax. Let the tension calm down. Relax. On your, on your guidance. Who has the procedure matter? Yes. Th thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm seeking your guidance. You're saying that they, they present the video clips to you, you review them, then you guide the House. Is it procedurally right to continue with the debate until or before you review the videos and guide the House? It is about substance over form. I thought you are an accountant. Substance over form. I have said I will go and review the, the, the videos if they are not relevant to this debate. I will come back and bring them on the floor that they were not. But we are closing this matter today. Yes, uh, Smagola. Uh, Madam Speaker, we are cross-border traders in Busia. <laughs> Madam Speaker, whereas uh, you have guided that uh, the leader of opposition is given five slots in this very important debate. We shall debate. have three independents. And we, uh, thank you, we Madam. We shall Speaker. have three independents. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Asuman, can you sit down? <laughs> Dr. Baird, sit. <laughs> you're not. You're not a smuggler. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Since both post I have got... Now let me start with the independence. Dr. Musemesa. Honorable Katuntu and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Macho. <laughs> but those are independents. <laughs> yes, Professor. Uh, sa thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. A debate of this nature really invites us to be nationalists and debate calmly for the interest of our people. I listened carefully to the statement by the minister and the rejoinder. And I think there are areas of common ground where evidence has been provided. I think this gives an opportunity for government again to cross-check and act appropriately in accordance with the law. I think this is, uh, this is okay, and uh, I don't think there should be much contention. But I also take exception where 
some concepts are used that insinuate or try to demean people. And I would appeal to all of us in this debate to avoid such a concept, such a insinuations that may ignite tensions in parliament or even outside the community. And this is addressed to all of us. And uh, finally, I would like to appeal to the oppositions that sometimes issues can also be handled outside the house. There are issues that can be handled outside the house. Madam Speaker, I request for your protection. You see, we are all in the government. The moment you are in parliament, whether in opposition or what, we are all in the government because government constitutes three branches. That's why consultations, even outside the house, are very critical for harmony uh, of this country. Because even when you are provided evidence, someone somewhere outside the house will take an appropriate action. The action cannot be taken, some actions cannot be taken here. They will be taken somewhere. And that's why harmony and respect for one another is very, very important. So the way forward, I am convinced to, uh, to, 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 to support, is that even after the debate here, let us continue to engage with one another with respect, with respect, so that we can all achieve the respect of human rights. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much, Your Honorable. Uh, thank you very much, Right Honorable Speaker, for giving me this opportunity. Right Honorable Speaker, the issue of human rights should be a common good. In the 60s, the people who were complaining about human rights abuses were basically people who were in the opposition. Then it came to the 70s. You had another regime in power. And the people who were being hunted, sometimes even killed, were those who were opposed to that regime. Then it came to the 80s. Those who complained were actually the ones who were in opposition, most specifically the Democratic Party, and those who were sympathetic to the NRA. In 1986, colleagues, the NRM regime established what we call the Odell Commission to investigate abuses of human rights from independence. For those of you who are familiar with that report, you would know what happened. This is not an era to talk about people disappearing without trace. We shouldn't. This is not a debate we should be having. And I don't want anybody to use this debate as a political spear to achieve a political purpose. But I don't want anybody also, in my view, to have a political shield because what eventually becomes a victim are the people of Uganda who are vulnerable. So can we address all the partisan interests in this color and address the issue? And if we do that, really we will live in a better country tomorrow. Why would we start talking politically when somebody out there is complaining about a lost child? a lost son, a lost husband. And I am here calling myself a parent and I'm not feeling the pain of that parent. I'm not feeling the pain of that child. Colleagues, these are not the issues to joke about. But when a debate like this comes, we are looking for solutions. 
we are looking for solution to the challenge. And I would like to thank both sides of the aisle now that we seem to become and let us discuss the solutions to the challenge we may be having. One, in the lead of opposition statement, he's complaining about three things. The first one which I read is about pre-detention without trial. Government. What can we do about it? What does the law say? Can you detain somebody without trial beyond 48 hours? So where should be the controversy be? Because it is constitutional. Do we have a constitutional order? So that is an area which, where we should all agree. If there are people who have been detained with the trial beyond the constitutionally mandated hours, those government should undertake to have them released unconditionally. And if they committed offense, however grave the offense is, then they will be subjected to the a due process of the, the law. What distinguishes civilized societies, colleagues, is us acting within the law and uncivilized people acting outside the law. That's what distinguishes us. So that should not be an issue for even right on Osika for us to debate and even our emotions rise high. Two, I see the right on law suggesting that there should be a judicial commission of it, inquiry. I have had the opportunity to look at the law. That is a prerogative of the government. Let them examine what is here, and if it warrants, then they have that opportunity. Because right on the speaker, we cannot as parliament resolve to create a judicial commission of inquiry because of the constitutional limitations we have. It would require resources, and once it is resources, then you cannot do it because it offends the constitution. So, let the government listen. And then say, well, in the circumstances, it, does this matter require a judicial commission of inquiry or not? Two. Three. The right honorable leader of opposition is suggesting to set up a select committee. We shouldn't have regrets in our own committees. We already have a, a, a committee on human rights. It's already in place. It's only under circumstances where we have not, we don't have a committee specifically provided for that we can resort to ad hoc and select committees. As of now, right honorable speaker, colleagues, let us have faith in our own committees which are in place. Because that's what the rules say. These matters can be handled by the Human Rights Committee and then we can report. We don't have to be every other time establishing commissions of select committees. That means we have no faith within our own committee. In any case, right honorable speaker, where are you going to get these members who are not from this committee? If you, have, you don't have faith in them, in these ones who are here, and they all belong to different committees. So are we going to get members outside? And the people who are on these committees actually were designated by both sides. The opposition designated members to that committee, and the government side also designated members. So we have committees in place who, which can discuss and investigate these matters which are still pending. We don't have to be establishing another select committee. Right on our speaker, there is this other issue which the... If they are compensated, I, I see compensation uh, on page, page three. What should be the problem? I thought the government had already taken that decision. I don't know why you were even debating it. Because the president came out clearly that if there are people who lost their lives unlawfully, then government is going to compensate their families. So the issue is, 
have those been compensated or not? And if they have not been compensated, then the government should undertake to follow up what his excess, the president, promised the country. We don't have to be debating so much about whether they should be compensated or not. Did they lose their lives unfairly during the riots? If they did, then they can be compensated in accordance with the law. And government has already taken a stand on that. So, I expect the Minister of Justice... Uh, Honorable Katrond, maybe just on compensation issues. Uh, and I think uh, AG's office is in line with what the President said. They've compensated some people and others are still under nego negotiation. And I wouldn't want this document to be laid on the table because it, it will expose these people. But we can share it with the, with the leader of opposition. Thank you very much, Right Honorable Speaker. Lastly, Right Honorable Speaker, it's about the issue of the Army Court. It's quite controversial, Army Court trying civilians. But this matter is in the Supreme Court, the issue is in the Supreme Court. We cannot be prosecuting a case here and the courts of law prosecuting the same case. We can't. We are going to cause a conflict of institutions of government. We are trying to conflict with each other on who has the money to do what. Honorable, in the members, case, honorable members, in that aspect, in that prayer, that would amount to sub -judice. And I'm happy that uh, my... say <laughs> that subjudice sub can only be de determined by the speaker and I'm determining that issue is amounts to subjudice. Right on, speaker, now that you've determined, I can't even go beyond so, what I mm, want to say. Mm. <laughs> but, but at the end of the day, there is a case of the Honorable Kave Ziruka. His Kave Ziruka. Right on, something like that. Kavaziruka. All right, Honorable Speaker. That reminds me of a joke with the, my friend Jen Otafide. He was seated and somebody said, I, I want Cham Sapat. And he was, why doesn't he put S in the right place and CH in the right place? So that name, which uh, my Kava. It's already the Supreme Court. And the issue there is whether the military courts have got a mandate to try civilians in the court march. Until that has been determined, I can't ask, I mean, we discuss it to what end? What are we going to resolve? That they have or they don't? Do we have that mandate? We can only have that mandate if we are changing the law. But even that to come to the floor, as long as that case is, has not been determined. I mean, in my view, like the Honorable Right Speaker uh, rules rightly, it should be sub -judice. So it is a very difficult subject, but we have no choice as of now. Let us await for the decisions of the Supreme Court, then we can one way or the other discuss. I want to thank you very much, Right Honorable Speaker.
Honorable Minister of Internal Affairs, can we hear from you? Right Honorable Speaker and Honorable Members, um, I've listened keenly and carefully the rejoinder shared belatedly by the Honorable Leader of Opposition. What is your procedure, Mother? Madam Speaker, based on your earlier guidance, that uh, this matter should not be a ping pong between the minister and the leader of opposition. And you prepared us to debate, and you gave both sides the number. Uh, have you changed the. <laughs> <laughs> now that the minister is coming on the floor, Madam Speaker, I'm seeking for your Honorable, Honorable Kanya. Uh, I'm not sure that you, you're competent enough to defy the directive of the speaker. <laughs> um, like I said, I listened carefully, right honorable speaker and honorable members, about the rejoinder of the honorable leader of opposition. And to show the seriousness of government, we had the cut say even to listen to the new things uh, he brought in his rejoinder, because we take seriously the matter of human rights. Uh, that said, uh, I want to still maintain, right, honorable speaker and honorable members, and stick to our response, which was honest, elaborate, and detailed. And it even uh, left avenues for remedy for those who felt unsatisfied by that response in anticipation, in anticipation. And those remedies are known to the law. Lope said that time, and I quote, he asked whether we feel pain and are alive and if we feel for others and are human. I want to restate here that we are both and even more. We do, however, even have the obligation as government to protect and preserve human rights as enjoined by the Constitution of Uganda. In other words, it is our call. If I may, my Colleagues will help on specifics, but I'll hazard some response on some of the issues raised in my response. Government did cons didn't conceal anything. We even gave more. You remember, Lead of Opposition talked about, for example, only 21 fatalities. Government gave all the 56 people who lost their lives. Is that not consistent with the government that wants to account? He didn't talk about injured persons. We revealed that there were people who were injured. Is that consistent with someone who wants to conceal the truth? And I even beg the question of the logic of mentioning only 21 people. Were those only party members of NUP? and the rest didn't matter, he, only he can answer. So government, in short, volunteered this information to demonstrate accountability. He didn't mention about the destruction in the riots and those responsible who were arrested, many tried and convicted, others released, and others uh, on bail. That too is accountability. 
In some, accountability shouldn't be selective. It must be honest and total. On the vehicles, we gave our all, which was sufficient. Uh, in particular, about the two identifiable ones, we even identified the driver of the police vehicle uh, regarding the girl who died. There was no attempt at all to cover up. What better accountability can we give? Fishing communities and related matters of pre-trial detention, explanations were given. In a nutshell, I want to say, right honorable speaker and honorable members, that um, it is the right of any aggrieved person to invoke the many revenues under the law if they are not sufficiently convinced by what government does, like in this instance, our colleagues on the other side. But I want to pledge that we shall continue to fulfill our obligation to address misconduct within law enforcement and security agencies, be they related to some of the hanging issues here or others that may arise. It is our calling and duty to do so to ensure the safety and security of Ugandans. I beg to submit, right honorable speaker. Oh. Honorable, honorable, uh, General, there is an issue that was raised on, on, on persons being detained without trial. We want a government commitment that you're going to make a follow-up. Make a follow-up. Yes. I mean, you make a follow-up and, uh, and, uh, uh, and see what can be done. Right, Honorable Speaker, we shall verify and if found to take appropriate action. Yes. Uh. Thank you, Right Honourable Speaker. Right Honourable Speaker, I, at I, the beginning in your preamble... I thought, I thought I was going to get murdered. You gave me a list. No, no. I wrote on a procedure, Madam, with your indulgence. Uh, when you ask the minister make a commitment on the people severally in detention without trial for several years. My understanding was that the minister was going to raise and uh, commit with the time frames because the minister is not only aware of the names, the numbers, and where they are detained, he's actually responsible for the, where they are and their conditions. I don't know, speaker, I find difficult and very compelling that I should listen to the minister at this level with that kind of tone. Right on the speaker, are we making headway? Which, which tone do you want him to use? Right on the speaker, maybe, the that's, minister, maybe that's how he speaks. Yeah, sure. The minister came here aware of people detained without trial for more than two and three years, respectively. He is also aware of the fact that the state has failed to prosecute them. Right on the speaker. Honorable. Without being clear on time frames and action, can Parliament debate in generalities? Honorable Law, let's debate on this issue. I will make decisions. Okay? I will make a ruling. Okay. Say, Gona. I want to thank you, Right Honorable Speaker, and I want to thank colleagues that have said that on matters of human rights, we should speak with one, fo one voice. I have opposed the Genome 7 all my life, but I've had one occasion, at least now, to, to agree with him on certain matters. I remember those days when the Honorable Chris Mariomunsi was held uh, at Ginger Road. Uh, in relation to the death of the Honorable Serena Nevada, I had my first agreement with Genome 7 when he said, those who say we kill civilians are idiots. Genome 7 has also told us, especially those of us who were not 
old enough during the days of Idi Amin, that the, the reason he called past leaders swine was because they did not know, they did not know the value of human life. Let's all agree with him that we must value human life from today on. First, were there abductions and did we have disappearances? And the answer is in the affirmative. Number two, are we proud as a parliament? As Professor Mshemeza said we are government. Are we proud as government that some people could not be accounted for in the year 2023 and that we can haggle over that? The answer is in the negative. Madam Speaker, we are not comfortable that some of our children disappeared. They left children unattended to. I listened to a story of a woman who remained may, with the know, child. May I thought yes, in this debate would act like what Honorable Katun did by coming with a way forward. Now that we know what is happening, how do we advise government? Thank you. Let me advise government as you go. How guide. do we work together to solve this problem? Okay. Let me advise government. Number one, the High Court has guided us in the case of Nicholas Opio versus the Attorney General. When Nicholas was being tried for, law, for a long time without readiness on the part of government, the court gave timelines, and what the state did was to withdraw. For those people that you have failed to prosecute for years, be humble and withdraw, because release, because you cannot prosecute them. Madam Speaker, I am an example. I'm a living example. In the year 2008, I was kidnapped. I was charged. Fifteen years down the road, I'm on bail. So there, but there are those that are not on bail. The issue has been understood. That's point number one. Number two, and I'm advising government, as you asked me. Number two, we have disagreed as politicians on what to do with these people who are allegedly in disappearance. Let's get somebody, let's get an arbiter. The constitution gave us an arbiter, and that is the judicial arm. Let's appoint a judicial committee, a judicial commission of inquiry where everybody will go and present and we shall all be bound. I am alive to the financial implications that have been alluded to by my brother, Honorable Katuntu. Very alive. That's why we, we are proposing to come up with a joint position as government. If we agree, it will come with the certificate of so financial So we are all now government. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay, we are. I'm happy you have agreed your government. Number three, the, uh, the issue, Madam Speaker. The issue that was raised with, by Honorable Katun to at, uh, affects Article 93. It has a financial implication of us getting a Judicial Service Commission. That's why it comes from all of us. Yes. Uh, let's agree. Let's agree. Number four, these security organiz organizations of ours, we made a law, the Security Organizations Act, in section 4, we did forbid them from arresting and detaining. Let them stop. Are you not embarrassed, colleagues in government, and now I'm talking about us, <laughs> that somebody is in police custody today. The following day, they say, we handed him over to CMI, and he's missing, and he's missing for years. Honorable members, honorable colleagues, let us Stop. Let us give confidence and equipment to our police to do their work. Let the security organizations do their work. I can see the, pro the trouble with my brother, General Mohose. General Mohose is the Minister of State for Internal Affairs. But he's not in charge of the people abducting. He's here speaking. The English call it being the ugly face of the devil. The person in charge of the abducting institutions is Jeno Muwezi. He's not here. Sorry for Jeno the closeness of the name. Jeno Muwezi. Security. We are dealing with CMI. We are dealing with ISO. 
because police had these people in custody and handed them over to CMI. The drones are not operated by the police. He wants, Madam to, he wants to clear something. Just let him clear. I know. For the record, is uh, CMI is not under the Honorable Jim. It's under UPDF. And, the under the Honorable Jim. both here. Under Honorable okay. both. <laughs> oh, I'm happy now that I have the suspect. The suspect is here. And I have the suspect closest to me and to my heart. I, and I, I want to thank Geno, Geno Mhozi for, for correcting me on that. But we have ISO. Now, now that both of both Honorable is here, he, let, let's see a commitment that his forces are going to comply with the law. Honorable both of both. We made a law and we said, your people should not arrest and detain citizens. And beyond detaining, you're detaining unconstitutionally. I want you to express your pride on the microphone and say we are doing the right thing under the, the Constitution and under the Act. Right, Honorable Speaker? Let's agree. I agree with the Honorable Katuntu that we have our committees and we should empower them to work. And these committees include the Committee on Human Rights, which, for the record we have stated before, is an oversight committee and is not a sectoral committee. It should not be the other side. It should be this side. That notwithstanding, and I have immense respect for the committee, as well as some fair respect for the Honorable Fox Odoi, and I will explain why fair. Why fair? Because he's the only one who has disagreed with the entire house. And uh, that notwithstanding, Madam Speaker, even a select committee is a committee of parliament it is envisaged in the rules to do a specialized job. And we have done it before. And that one is done by none other than the person we trust most in this house. It is you, the speaker. Madam, sit in that chair. Take that decision. Appoint this select committee. For those other issues that we cannot agree on as politicians, let us refer them Indeed, I am very happy the Honorable Minister for Justice has come out to say that as government, and I quote him, we are stuck naked on the issue of human rights. Now, I want all of us to wash ourselves clean. Let's appoint a committee that is purely professional, that is devoid of political biases, that will bring all of us together it is a discretion, I agree, a discretion of the minister. That's why we are here, to appeal to the minister. Unfortunately, he's not here. Oh, the deputy is here. I'm glad that the deputy minister for justice is here. Clarification is never denied, especially from a person like me. Be respectful, Honorable. Uh, thank you very much, Right Honorable Speaker. I thank Honorable Gona for yielding the floor. You insinuate that committees of the House produce biased work. Could you clarify? Because you are saying a select committee is the only one, just hold on, is the only one which can give work which is professional and biased, as if the various committees which we constitute in the House cannot give objective and professional work. Honourable, honourable that? members, I'm very happy. Honourable members, before uh, before you, first of all, the committees that we have are very professional committees, and the committees do a very good job. One of my best committees in this house is uh, uh, Park Central. Park Central, headed by none other than uh, Honourable Segona and uh, Honourable. Uh, as a man. It's one of the best committees. And, and, and let's, like what Honorable Abudu said, 